Shall we turn in our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20? 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We are in a seven-part series on how to survive. Uh, I came across this thought when we were watching some of the things from Japan. I've been to Japan a couple of times and in North Korea and, and South Korea, I should say, and it's been a, a long time ago, but I remember it vividly. Uh, people were committing suicide like crazy over there in Japan. One out of 40 kids were committing suicide. And the government asked me to come over. I had long hair then, down on my waist, and, and uh, so I was definitely a hippie way back then. They didn't know what to think of me, but we had a great time with the kids. I learned quite a bit. was able to minister to about, oh, 15,000 kids at one time, and uh, just had a great time. I spoke at the 9th Infantry at the South Korean Army, and uh, about 1,500 men, and uh, I gave the altar call, and it was kind of cute. They all kind of looked back at their general, and he nodded, and 1,300 stood up. And I thought, what's this? Maybe they didn't understand what I was asking. So I said the same thing again, and they all stood up. So it was just a great time, and when you look at that, you think, my gosh, Lord, what is going on? And been through so much, and my heart breaks for them. But as I look around, I realize it's going to happen here, there's no doubt. Uh, it's happening around the world. When you look at prophecy, the last 40 years in prophecy, uh, people are having a hard time figuring out. People are asking me, what's going on? I honestly don't know. Uh, that's what's really weird. Usually you can figure it out. You can see, but I know that the end of the world is coming. I know that things are lining up. I know the Antichrist is probably being groomed right now. I know that in Iran, they're hoping that, you know, the Troth Amman is going to come. They're going to make it happen. I see what's happening in Libya. We're in three different wars. I see what's happening with our finances. I see what's going on in the school district. I see what's happening with 30,000 criminals being released you know, every year into L.A. It's just a mess, no matter where you look. And there's no answers. And I believe that it's going to set the stage for one person who's going to have the answer. And that's not the Lord. That would be the Antichrist. But until that time, we're going to have to be faithful to the Lord. It's going to be more difficult. They're going to come after, no doubt, free speech, the church, so on. But I think that we have something we have. We have the ability to speak with absolute authority. And the churches, which ought to be, should be teaching, are not teaching the Word of God. So I believe that God has blessed here, and we're going to continue doing it. But I do believe we're going to come to a time. So saying all that, I thought, what could I do to help you? I mean, what could I really do? And I could teach on prayer. I could teach on certain things. But how is that going to help you when you find yourself maybe in an earthquake and maybe your husband or your boyfriend's gone, your cells don't work, you can't get a hold of anybody, you don't know where the kids are at, there are some neighbors, you can't get there, and all of a sudden, what are you going to do? And no doubt, we look at L.A., we think, you know, something's definitely going to happen here. We look at the world, we've touched Israel, something definitely is going to happen all over. And I just don't know if it's judgment or revival. I would choose revival any moment because the glory of God would be seen and God would change and many people would come to the very knowledge of God. But if that's not going to be the case, then probably judgment. But anyway, what's going to happen? So we dealt with the foundation and the foundation of God is that you would know the purpose of God, the power of God, and the plan of God in your life. Well, this morning we want to talk about really what it is to pray. But more than that, can you talk to God? You've heard me say over the pulpit that if I could do my kids different, I would do it. I would teach them how to pray and how to spend more time with them in prayer. Because if you can talk to God, you can work through anything in your life. You don't become bitter, resentful, you begin to understand the heart of God, the mercy of God, the tenderness of God, and you begin to blame yourself before you would ever blame Him. The problem today is that most Christians blame God. We blame God for everything, our divorce, our unhappiness, our misery, everything else, when in reality, God didn't have a lot to do with it. We didn't listen to Him. We didn't wait on Him. We do what we want to do. We're stubborn, stiff-necked. And now we blame God for everything. And it goes all the way back to the garden. Eve, Adam blamed Eve. I never asked for this woman. You gave it to me. Eve blamed Sir, Satan. And Satan said, don't blame me. God, you made me. So God just gets blamed all the time. 
And so what I want to do is try to teach this in such a way that you can really grab a hold of it. An acronym is something that is a, a word that means something bigger. The word like golf, G-O-L-F, and you think, all right, golf. Well, it used to mean gentlemen only, ladies forbidden. It was a time when golf first started, women were not allowed to play golf. We know that historically. It wasn't right, and so we see that how women have come up, and it should be that way. But they've shortened that, gentlemen only, ladies forbidden, to the word goth. And the same with north, east, south, west. They call it news. And so when you look at an acronym, sometimes it's easy to grab a hold of it. And so we're going to use one today called prayer, P-R-A-Y. And what I want you to do is just try to listen with all your heart, take notes, maybe grab the tape, and when you get yourself into a situation, after you panic and go crazy and, and scream and yell, stop. Because now I need you to focus in and find God. And God is there. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. He's going to speak to you in a very profound way. He's going to show you what to do. He's going to tell you what to do. And that's what we're going to work on in our life. I want you to come to know the heart and the voice of God better than you've ever known it before. Because either you hear God's voice or you hear the enemy. Either you're going to be obedient to God or you're going to be obedient to the things of selfishness. And we would rather be obedient to God. In 2 Chronicles, it goes on to declare, very simply, he was now going to survive, O uh, Jehoshaphat, O our Lord God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know what we to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Now notice the very last phrase, our eyes are upon thee. We don't know what to do. And to me, that is one of the great statements of the Bible. Because it tells you that a man who now is the king, a king of the southern kingdom, Jehoshaphat, is honestly willing to acknowledge that he doesn't know what to do. And when you find a man who's willing to do that, you have found a jewel. Because most guys would never ever admit it. They will tell you they're not lost, but they don't know where they're going. And that's just the way it is. I think the Bible is pretty clear about that. One of the jokes we kind of share is that when they finally found Jesus, two years later, Jesus was now about two, three years old, and the wise men finally found him. And he was in a house. He wasn't in a manger. Kind of messes up the manger story. But it kind of shows you that if guys are in charge, they're going to get lost. Now, if you would have put women in charge, they probably would have found the baby probably three or four months later on. But guys would die before they asked for help. And they nod, like, I understand, and they don't understand. They're not writing it down. They go left, left, right, right, left. Got it, got it, got it. You don't have it. Your wife knows you don't have it. And yet you're nodding all the way. And sure enough, you go out, you go left, and you should have gone right, and your wife tells you. And will you stop? No. And even the GPS we have, we don't trust those either. I was with Rob the other day, and... and uh, if GPS said, turn left, and Rob said, no, turn right. I said, Rob, this is hooked up to the satellite. He goes, I know this place, like the back of my hand. I said, Rob, this is very expensive stuff. And so we went right, and we got lost. And I said, I'm not listening to you ever again. You know, I'll take this any day over you, Rob. So it's like it's hard because our minds won't let us do it. Well, the story goes in Jehoshaphat is that he went out to visit his friend in the northern kingdom. He should have never went because he was unequally yoked. And so he's hanging out with the king from the north, and the king decides to go out and go to war against Syria. And once again, the prophet of God came and said, I'm going to, you shouldn't go. And so, you know, the king of the north beat the prophet, and Jehoshaphat didn't do anything. Jehoshaphat was over the king of the south, two tribes, and the king of the north were over ten tribes. And so, Finally, the king of the north said, hold my garment, I'm going to go out and fight. And so now Jehoshaphat, who should not have been there, is holding the garment of the king. And the king has taken the peasant's outfit because he's out there killing people and he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. But the Syrian king said, whoever holds the garment, that's the king, kill him. So Syria's army turned towards Jehoshaphat. 
And Jehoshaphat's holding this, and he begins to realize, I'm in trouble. So he drops it and begins to run back to the southern kingdom. He gets all the way back, and like no one knows what's happened, but a prophet meets him. And the prophet says, you have been disobedient to God. You have an unholy alliance with the king of the north. Therefore, judgment is coming, and they're going to surround the city of Jerusalem, and damage is going to be done. So because of that, now Jehoshaphat, he takes his children. He takes his wife. He stands before the court or before the temple with all the leadership, and he says, I have made a mistake. I don't know what to do, but God, our eyes are upon you. That is probably the most profound statement in our life today. We don't know what's going on, but our eyes are upon you. And if you are here today and you don't know what's going on, and your eyes are not on the Lord, then you need to listen very, very carefully because God wants you to know. It says, O our God, will thou not judge them? No, not this time, Jehoshaphat, you were the problem. For we have no might against this great company, the ones that surrounded Jerusalem, Moab and Ammon, that comes against us. Neither know what we to do. You can't do anything. But the conjunction, our eyes are upon you. That's where we need to be today. Our eyes are upon you. And so why should I be concerned? Because of what is taking place in the world in which we live. I think Billy Graham said it the very best. There is no doubt that we are a people are in serious trouble today. We are caught up in a stream of history that is beyond our ability to control. If there ever was a time that we need to be on our knees in prayer, asking God to save us and our nation, it is right now. But it's not happening. And the reason why is because we're not desperate. We just don't seem to get it. It's going to have to happen physically for us to really open our eyes to it. Because prayer is not real important to us because it takes too much work. We'd rather come listen to the Bible and get out than to bow our knee and humble ourselves before God. You can do a prayer meeting in any church and maybe get 20, 30 people there. And yet you can teach a Bible study and pack it out. And it just shows you exactly the problem. People don't know how to pray. And they don't know why they want to pray. And they're mad at God because things have not gone right. It says in Second Chronicles in chapter 14, Ezra, he says this, stands before God. In Ezra, in Second Chronicles chapter 14, verse 11. He says, Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on Thee, and in Thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, Thou art our God, let not man prevail against Thee. So God, we're going to go out. We don't have a lot of people, but it doesn't make a difference. It's not about numbers, it's about You. And God, by the way, just a little note, P.S., they're against You, not us. So defend us, and God did. And then we read one more time in Isaiah 62, verse 6. Very powerful verse. I have set a watchman upon the walls of Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. That's the responsibility of a pastor or a leader. I am to stand. I am to proclaim. I am to share. Jesus Christ is coming. We need to get right with God. But at the same token, I need to stand at home. And my home needs to be committed to God. And you as men need to do the very same thing at work. Or you women who work, you need to do the very same thing at work. You are the watchmen, men and women, who are going to stand for Jesus Christ. You can see the times, you can see the seasons, and you can sense things are happening and people are afraid. And now the question comes, are you going to do something about it? Are you going to be silent? Like in Germany, and we lose it all? Or are you going to speak, and you're going to share, and you're going to come outside the insecurity of our own life? He goes on to say, we cannot keep silent. And give him no rest till he establish, until he makes Jerusalem a place of praise. 
And then God said three things about the church. And these are very important to pay attention. Number one, Isaiah 59, verse 16. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So God looked out and said, where are the people praying? Are they interceding for Lebanon? Are they interceding for Japan? Are they praying their hearts out for our schools and the teachers? And are they praying for the governments or have they just given up? And then he said again in Isaiah 63, verse 5, I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, there is none that call upon the name that stirs up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us. In other words, there's none. So in chapter 59, verse 16, he saw that there was no man. In Isaiah 63, verse 5, I looked and there was none to help. And then Ezra, or I should say Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And this was God's indictment upon the earth. I'm looking today for men and women to stand in the gap, and I can't find them. I'm looking for men and women who are coming to a point in their life they're not embarrassed about making a stand for Jesus Christ. He can't find them. And I think the answer is that, yes, we have to be those people. And I want to be that person more than anything else. And so God is asking, are you willing to stand for me? And the answer is yes. Now, why cannot we do it? I think most of the problem lies in the fact that we're upset with God. Either something hasn't happened right, or we have a hurt, or something radically has altered our behavior towards God. And so we're kind of upset with God. We don't really trust Him. We don't really believe in Him. And so we love Him, but we don't really count on Him. We don't bring Him into our life. Let me give you an example. Are you praying that God, once again today, adds gasoline to your gas tank? No? Okay. And then keep paying the gas. You mean God might do that? We have not because what? We ask not. Well, the, oh, Pastor Steve, I'm going to have to blog now because now you're really going crazy. Am I really? It said that when Jesus took the fish and fed them, you remember the three loaves and two fish? When he was done, there were 12 baskets left over. If God can multiply fish, can he also multiply gasoline? Yeah, sure he can. But we have not because we what? That's not. So a lot of times in our life, we don't bring God into our life. When I begin to go with my wife shopping, I start praying. Oh, God, make it quick. Make it painless, you know. But if she's in that let's go shopping, I think, oh, God, how can I get her to the thrift shop? Just Because you can only spend so money, much money at the thrift shop. But this, let's go. You know, I'm thinking, oh, no. And yet we go. And it's fun. So she's here, so i got to say it's fun. But I'm always praying, God, give me the sales. God, give me, help me, show me. And it's amazing what happens, how God opens doors. But we don't do that because we think, no, we can't do that. And then we don't pray when we drive. Why not? The way you drive, you ought to be praying. You know, you ought to never be on the phone texting. But we do, and we shouldn't, and that's how people get hurt. And so here we are. And if you do it, you ought to at least pray, God, help me. Get caught in Jesus' name or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe you're a poor witness, and the only time your witness is really good is when your car is parked. Then take the bumper stickers off at least. But here we are. We're just going crazy in this world, and we're not praying anything for anything that makes sense. And that's what I want to share with you. So let me go through this. Four things I want to share with you. P-R-A-Y, pray. And it means very simply, first we're going to praise Him, and then we're going to once again request, and then we're going to accept, and finally we're going to yield to His Spirit. And this is what we need to do. It says here, Lord, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to pray. And the first one is P, very simply, which means to praise Him, to sing to Him. Now, why would I want to sing to the Lord? The Bible says that God made you to be an instrument of praise. He made you that you would be worthy to be an instrument worthy to praise Him. It brings pleasure to God. 
Well, sometimes I don't want to sing. It doesn't make a difference. It's by faith I need to once again exercise that gift that God's given to me. So I come to church, I fold my hands. That's fine. doesn't bother me. But I'm thinking in my own heart, if you could just open your mouth, if you could just understand why God gave you what He gave you, if you could just get beyond that moment of anger or frustration or bitterness or get it out of your heart, you would do so much better. And so the first thing I realize is that I am going to sing. Why? Because it makes God happy. It brings pleasure to my God. He made me for that purpose. It says in Psalm 100, verse 1, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pastures. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him. Bless His name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. And let's go over that. Number one, in verse one, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Well, God, an earthquake just happened. How am I going to do that? I understand. But after you've done it, and you're there, and it stopped, and the family's okay, let's just start praising God. Now, I'm not asking you to praise God because God brought an earthquake, but I am asking you to thank God that He has kept you alive and that you're healthy and that you can now help other people. You see, when I get bitter with God, when I become very resentful because of what's happened in my life, maybe because a boyfriend has broke up with me or I married somebody, it hasn't worked out, why do I blame God when I never asked His permission to begin with? And we often go down this road and we begin to blame God for everything that's happened in our life when He didn't have anything to say with it. We went out and bought the house without Him. We bought the car without His knowledge. We went out and did this and did that. We never stopped to think for one moment, maybe we ought to not do it. But when we do that stuff and then we make a mistake, we ought to be able to say, okay, Lord, now help me. And that's what He's saying. Come to the presence and so begin to thank God. And that's the question, very simply. Can you very simply sing to Him? Well, look what just happened. I know. Maybe a loved one has gone home. How do you thank God for that? Well, you don't. But you have to thank God that that person's in heaven. And that God is going to take better care of that child. And God is going to love that kid. And that kid's never going to suffer one day more. And that kid is going to be running and leaping and praising God and never fall. Down here, who knows what could happen. And maybe God is sparing you something you have no knowledge of. And so sometimes we just don't give God the ability to be big enough in our life. God is gracious and God is good. And the Bible says that His thoughts for you are not evil, but good to an expected end. And that which He has begun in you, He's going to see it done. And if He never leaves you, and He never forsakes you, and He's always there, and I'm the one who leaves Him, and I'm the one who cops the attitude, but He doesn't because He's always the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, you would think that I would begin to have a friend with this God. I'd begin to talk to Him. Well, I don't feel like singing, but if we want to talk, then I'll listen to what you have to say. At least do that. Get to a point in your life that you and God are at least talking. And today, society has done so many things and you're so broken up and things are so tough that you're getting upset with God. Martha did. If you were here, my brother would not have died. People have been upset with God. Elijah said, I want to take my life. And Job said, cursed be the day I was born. I wish I was born, born, stillborn in my mother's womb. Many have wanted to just end their life because it was so hard, but they all came around. Every one of them came around and saw that God was right. Even Peter, when he cursed God, and Jesus looked at Peter, and Peter knew what he did. Because God was telling Peter, this is what you're going to do. And Peter said, I'll never do that. And how often we argue with God. Don't go down that road. I wouldn't do that. Don't go down that road. I wouldn't do that. And we find ourselves like Jehoshaphat, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong guy, who's not even a Christian, and God has to work in our life to get us out of that mess. And then we get mad at God. It's amazing how much God has been good to you. And so he says here, make a joyful noise. Verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. 
In other words, be happy. Don't be all bummed out all the time. And come to His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. He has made us and not we ourselves. We are His sheep and we are the pastors of His flock. He is the Lord, we are the sheep. And then he says in verse 5, 4, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And so number one, I need to learn to start praising God. And you say, well, why? Because you're never going to pray unless you don't. If you cannot let it go, if you cannot make it right, if you cannot say to yourself, against you and you only have I sinned, I put myself in this situation. It wasn't my husband. I didn't listen to you. It wasn't that kid. I didn't listen to you. I accept responsibility. At that moment, God's going to turn your heart. He's going to give you a new heart. And you're going to be able to see like you've never seen before. And God's going to turn you around and use you for the glory of God. And He'll put that song back in your heart. And the joy will be in your life. There's nothing worse than a song that's dead. And so many people are trying to talk to God when they don't have any joy for God at all in their heart. Well, let's just go first step first. Lord, teach me how to worship You. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it. I know that You never make a mistake. Your endurance is forever. Your mercy is always good. You never make a mistake because You couldn't be God. I accept that by faith. And all of a sudden, that song begins to well up. And you can't keep your mouth shut. And you begin to hymn a little thing. And all of a sudden, you feel a release in your heart. You need to start praising God. Not because a child has died or because an earthquake has come, but because God is there in the midst of everything and you still have life. And as long as you have life, you have the ability to help other people. And God, help me to help other people. So number one, Lord, teach me how to pray. First of all, let me worship you. But number two, Lord, teach me how to pray. Notice the R. It has to deal with request. In other words, not only am I going to sing to him, but I am going to share with him. I'm going to say to God, I need to talk to you today. Well, what do you want? I just want to tell you how I feel about you. Okay. And God would basically say, I'd love to have you do that. I know how you feel, but let's do it. Let's talk. Let's come together, reason together. God wants you to do that. He knows how you feel, knows what you're going to do, knows where you live, knows what you're driving, knows how much gas you have left in your car. He knows all that stuff. Knows how much you have in the bank. Knows what you've done, which you shouldn't. Knows if you've been nice or mean, whatever it been. God knows everything about you. And so all of a sudden, God is saying, Stephen, I just want you to trust me and praise me, and I'll be with you. Okay, God, then what do you want me to do? Well, Steve, I want you to come to a point in your life that you ask for help. You are going to request it. Now think about this. Why should I ask you for help? I don't need help. I know how to sew. Well, why did you sew that pocket upside down? Well, I'm a little nervous, that's all. A little stressed out today. Oh, why didn't you ask God to help you? Well, why? Why would I waste a prayer, prayer on that? Well, let me give you another example. You're going to work on your carburetor, guys, when you go home. And you hear this voice, ask God to bless this. But you don't. And so all of a sudden you're talking and you drop the nut inside the carburetor. And all of a sudden, now the thing's inside the manifold. Now you've got to take the engine apart to get to the... It's just, what happened? Why? Well, God was speaking. And all of a sudden, you begin to crank that little carburetor, and you hear this voice saying, don't do it no more. Stop. And one more little... Cr and you snap the boat. And you get so mad. Or what about this? Trying to balance the book. You've been doing it for 50 days, and you still can't get it. Have you asked for help? I don't need to help. I can figure it out. See how prideful that is? Arrogant. Or maybe you, you just got an operation. I don't need no food. I can handle it myself. Really? You can do everything yourself, huh? You can mow the yard, and you can go out shopping, you can do everything else, but you just got out of the hospital, huh? You can do all that? And the answer is no, but I'm too prideful to ask for help. It's beneath me to have you help me. Well, you know, when I had my back operated on, was in the hospital for all those days, weeks, and under anesthesia for eight and a half hours, I had to have help. There's no way around it. I couldn't do it. 50 stitches in my stomach, 50 stitches in my back. No L4, L5, L3 gone. Rods holding me up. I, I, had to, I, I needed help. I had to ask pastors to come teach because I couldn't do it. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. 
And when all of a sudden you realize that you can't talk to your husband, you can't talk to your kids, you can't reason with anybody, you won't ask anybody to help you, and so you're dying right here, but you can't let no one know because you're so prideful. Isn't that crazy? Wouldn't it be nice if all of a sudden your wife came and said, pray for me, I'm just going through a tough time right now. Sure, I'd love to. All of a sudden does two things. One, she's not mad at you, I don't think. And two... You get to pray with her. She's coming. She's asking. And when you do that, there's no pride. We are prideful and arrogant. That's why we have this chip on our shoulder. We won't worship. And that's why we can't talk to God. I don't want to talk to him right now. I'd do anything but talk to him. And Satan is lying to us. And so at a time in our life, we need to hear God. We can't hear from God. Because the two things are happening. Satan is messing us up again. We can't hear from God. And we don't trust God. And we don't like God. We don't say that. Because we come to church, we worship God, but we go out and we live our life and we do everything else, we don't ask Him. You see, it's all about bringing God into your life. And when a crisis comes, what are you going to do? You're going to turn to God or turn away from God? 80% turn away from God. I want to teach you something different. I want to teach you that you turn to God. And by turning to God, God is going to reward you in a very powerful way. And notice He says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving. Ready? Let your request be known to God. Isn't that cool? Lord, I'm gaining weight. Help me. Well, what, that is so stupid, is it? Lord, take away the appetite. Lord, take the food out of the icebox. <laughs> Lord, take the desire away. Take my nervousness away, Lord. God, let me do it for you. In other words, I can't do it. I can't ask another brother, help me. Maybe if he's the same color, I could, but not, I'm not, I'm not going to go beyond my, why not? I thought we're brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, and we can have help. Yeah, we should. Well, then do it. Amazing, when I had all my operations, now you're having all your operations. If you can do it, I can do it. People are saying that all the way to me. They say, hey, I just had double knee surgery. What? Well, you did it, yeah. Well, I'm going to do it. Well, if you're not afraid, I didn't say that, but good, great. And so it says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall be in your heart. So does God know what you're going through? Uh-huh. Has God allowed it to happen? He has. Is he waiting for you? Yes. Does he want you to explain it to him? No. Why? Because he knows what you're going through. Just ask him for help. Peter said, help. That's a great prayer. God, I need help. My heart is getting cold. And once again, Lord, I need you. Such a great thing. Third thing I find very important. Lord, teach me how to pray. Notice the A. So important, I need to accept. You see, I need to learn to praise God. Secondly, I need to learn to request, ask God. But number three, this is the tough one. Lord, I need to learn to accept it. God, I'm not getting any better. I know. I pray this all the time, God, give me health. I know. But my grace is sufficient for thee, Stephen. That's all you need to know. Well, God, what are you doing? Uh, you don't need to know. God, what about my kids? You don't need to know. God, you want me to come to you, but you don't tell me everything. Stephen, I can't tell you everything. I'm God, you're not. How's that? And all of a sudden, he said to Job, stand up. Yeah, God, what do you want? Where were you when I made the crocodiles? Where are you when I flung the stars into existence? 77 questions later, Job says he fell back in the dirt and began to suck dirt. He's saying, I don't, I'm not worthy to even know. And what he's saying is that in his life, he was self-righteous and he wouldn't pray. I don't need to pray. I can't pray. Don't like to pray. Don't want to pray. Why? Why? Because it doesn't work. Why? Usually because of sin or because I'm angry with God. Well, how about this? How about you and God? Being in love. How about this? There's no one who has stood with you. If you got into jail, your friends didn't go to jail with you. God went to jail with you. There's no one that sticks closer than a friend. No one that will be with you when everyone else rejects you. No one that will stand with you when everyone else is against you. God will. You see, so for that point, I say to God, if you want to listen to my crazy voice, I'd love to sing. Because I've been wanting to sing for a long time. Stephen, go ahead. Secondly, God, i got some things i got to talk to you about. I don't understand. I know. God, are you with me? I am. Are you going to help me? I will. 
And third, God, what do I have to accept whatever I send into your life, son? Well, what does that mean? I'll tell you when it's time. Well, I don't like that. Well, Stephen, I died upon that cross. I went the way of the cross, and for the joy that was set before me, I endured that cross. Will you take that? Will you bear that? Will you stand up and be a leader? Will you not worry about who you are? And the answer is yes, but teach me, Lord. And so he says here, and number three, he says in Hebrews 11:6, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder. In other words, if you accept it, then God's going to bless you. And remember Habakkuk? In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He looks to the barns. They're empty. He looks to his icebox. Empty. He looks to the stove. Empty. Looks to the table. Empty. But he knows that God's bringing Nebuchadnezzar and he begins to jump for joy because at least God is in his life. That's all I need. Because God can feed me with a raven. And God can open this door. And God can bring this together. And God can shield me. And God can protect me. And God can help me. But if I'm angry with God, I'm in trouble. If I'm doing what I want to do, I'm in trouble. I need to learn at this time in my life, more than ever before, how to hear God's voice. Because I don't want to make a mistake with you or anybody else. God, lead me down the path that's righteous before you. I need to worship you. I need to be honest with you. I need to give you the things bothering my life. And he says here very powerfully, Lord, I need to accept what's going on. Well, maybe you had a miscarriage. I can't accept that. You have to accept it. Or maybe something else has happened. You know, I was molested. I have to accept it. And God's used it. I have to accept it. Don't have to. But I want to. Because I believe that God's using it in a very powerful way. So when I realize everything, everything can not touch me unless it goes through his hands. And lastly, Lord, teach me how to pray. Notice the why. It stands for it's time to yield your life, to surrender. Let him have you. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse 40, And when he was at the place, the, the garden, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. He withdrew from his disciples, saying, Father, if thou wilt be willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And all of a sudden, the angels came and said, hey, we're here to strengthen you. The answer was no. Jesus, Father, if there's any way to get this cross out of my life, please, nope, no other way. Then fine, for the joy that's set before me. Now, take it back. I'm home. Things begin to rumble. Husband's away. I'm at home. Animals are there. Everything's happening. By the grace of God, I finally get out of that thing, and I'm panicking. So I turn off the gas and turn off the water, and then I don't know what to do because the phones aren't working. You sit down, and you begin to pray, God, speak to me right now in this midst of this horrible situation. Comfort my heart. Put my mind back together. Why? Because everyone else in your neighborhood is going crazy except you. God will show you. God will bring a peace in your life. God will give you great strength above your own strength. And God will use you in a very powerful way. Because you are trained on hearing the voice of God. So you cannot afford to get weird or bitter or resentful. I'd have to say that you've made a mistake, not God. I've made a mistake, not God. God is good. God has always been good. And his thoughts for me are not evil, but good to an expected end. He's always done wonderful things. Now, he has brought obstacles because I have got out of God's will. But God has rescued me back to his heart. It's a great God.